So now I'm going to sing the Doom song. Disasters and risks are interesting, and, but one of the problems is actually that they're interesting to us, because that's causing a lot of bias in our thinking about them. Uh, and conversely, of course, they can also be important. And one of the most interesting things about disasters is that they tend to be extremely unexpected. Anybody recognize this particular disaster? Kobe? No. Japan? No. San Francisco? No. Right continent and country? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, Boston in 1990 after the molasses flood. Uh, the the, the, the flood with molasses. Yes, 150 injured, 21 dead. Molasses. Sorry, what, uh, what, what, what year was that? Uh, well, the, the miss was 1919. So 1919 or 1919? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So essentially, the, the American alcohol company had an enormous cast iron tank of crude molasses for use in alcohol production. It was apparently not very well built, and on a pretty warm day, suddenly it just burst, and an enormous wave of high viscosity molasses flooded a, 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 a sizable part of town. Now, afterwards, of course, they claimed, oh, Italian anarchists were behind it. It was an act of terrorism. <laughs> Most people just felt that it was the company, and there were some pretty interesting court cases after that. Uh, but the interesting thing is, of course, molasses uh, flooding is definitely not uh, the high on the scale of risks we normally think about. And in general, of course, most risks uh, tend to fall into different categories. Yeah, it might be a good idea to know the light. Yeah. And now you can fall asleep very gently. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So in general, of course, uh, there is a lot of interesting issues going on about risk. Yeah. As I said, uh, it's exciting. That's why we make games uh, about it. Uh, we might even, in a post-ideological uh, world, uh, use it uh, politically. Uh, after all, if you're a politician today, uh, you can't really argue for many uh, things based on any particular ideology, because the voters are not terribly keen on ideology, most of them, and it sounds so flat. But on the other hand, if you find a risk, Everybody's supposed to agree that that risk needs reducing. So, of course, nobody can resist your argument that I observe a risk. We need to reduce it, cost what it may. And uh, there is a lot of very interesting sociology going on in this game of controlling risks. Conversely, we also have uh, this effect, uh, like uh, the previous talk that Mike Darn pointed out, that this risk aversion has pretty serious effects on our society. If we're not allowed to do experiments uh, because we might cause um, uh, some damage to ourselves, well, how are we, are we allowed to do experiments? An interesting example is if I want to just do a survey to check what uh, the things would people like to enhance themselves in, I would actually probably have to get ethics approval from my university, which would at least take one month, and I would need to fill out a pretty long set of forms. Of course, I could just privately just set up a web form and uh, do it immediately on my blog. But as a researcher, I'm probably supposed to follow this route because somebody might get hurt by answering an online form. And we might, uh, of course, laugh at this, but on the other hand, we're obviously that some risks in research are serious, and uh, we might want to figure out good ways of handling that. So I'm going to be uh, looking at different ways of thinking about risk, in particular uh, the, the problems we have when estimating the likelihood of risks happening. Uh, generally, when considering what decisions to make, we need to think about how likely is a risk, how, how big is a hazard, how bad would it be when it would happen, and then how we combine them. And uh, the traditional engineering approach is let's multiply the probability by the badness, and then you get some kind of number, and then you look what is uh, the biggest number and the best course of action. That's not necessarily true. There is a lot of complications here. In particular, there is the problem that we don't uh, normally think about risk in this kind of very rational, cold manner. Uh, a human life is worth much more than uh, six million dollars, which is the standard actu actuarial uh, value of a life, at least for an American. Uh, there is a kind of uh, a whole theory actually about calculating the economic value of human lives, and most people get rather nervous when they hear about it. On one level, we're aware of that we need to consider how much money to spend on roads and other safety measures. On the other hand, saying that you're worth that many million dollars, that sounds wrong. There is even a very interesting research by an American uh, uh, psychologist, I think he is, Tetlock, who demonstrated that when you pose this kind of exchange, well, how, how much money, a secular value, is a human life worth, a kind of sacred value, 
when people get into a situation, first they try to avoid making that choice. And afterwards, they demonstrate that they become more conservative on moral choices. They clean their hands much more. more when uh, he set this up as a psychology expert, so he actually watched how much people clean, clean their hands when they're leaving. But they donate more to charity to kind of cleanse the conscious, uh, the conscience of, the, of this uh, choice. And the people get very upset when they find that somebody can make this kind of comparison very readily. Oh, I think uh, that, of course, uh, healthcare systems should be a free market. That's, again, free market, no, no, that's a secular value uh, if you're on the left. Healthcare, oh, that's sacred value on your left. So people to the left get very upset when libertarians suggest that. Meanwhile, conservatives get terribly upset when people think that, oh, we can weigh in uh, the, uh, the stem cell research versus health benefits. No, 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 one of these is a sacred value, you're not allowed to do that. So this poses an interesting uh, issue about the intangibles. Hazards can actually be against things which have no fixed value. But in most of my talk I'm going to talking about threats to human lives, which we all agree are at least terribly valuable. Yes, sir? I, I heard a figure recently, the NHS will spend up to £30,000 per year or something to extend their life. The drug costs more than that. Will, and that's how they work out. Well. Yeah, one year worth Yeah, uh, and there are various uh, of these numbers, and most of them are somewhat hard to get because uh, most organizations don't really like to publish or say that that's actually how much it is. For example, the, the Nice uh, organization here in the UK, they certainly internally have some kind of scales they uh, are using to determine what's cost-effective or not. But they're not terribly keen on allowing uh, outsiders to actually know how that reason is going on which is actually problematic. I think transparency can help us quite a lot here. The interesting thing, problem is, of course, and I'm definitely not an expert on this, but I'm very interested in the whole area, so of course I'm cognitive biases, and I know there are certain others here that know much more about this than I do. But as a general rule, uh, risks are about things that are relatively uncommon, and we're very bad at thinking about probabilities that are low, especially about very low probabilities. Uh, on the other hand, once we have an example, we have a bias that, uh, to uh, overestimate probabilities. So after uh, Hurricane Katrina, people were expecting much more hurricanes. If you look at predictions of uh, hurricanes, uh, not just lay predictions, but also the technical predictions done by uh, meteorologists, they expected much more hurricanes the year after Katrina than before. They were completely wrong, of course, but uh, th that doesn't matter. When you have an example, you start seeing uh, the risk everywhere. 9-11 is a, another great example. Suddenly, everybody was looking for terrorist plots everywhere. And, uh, of course, by looking, you can find them. Or at least you can find signs that they might be around, which again can feed into this cautious of looking for risk. So one of the best ways of getting false alarms, actually, about certain risks is to educate people about the risks. Because now we're aware that they exist. Uh, when somebody points out to you that, oh, ammonia would make a pretty good uh, uh, weapon, a terrorist attack on a major city, suddenly you start to notice how many trucks loaded with ammonia are traveling around on the roads. And then, of course, if you're in a decision-making position, you're going to think about, oh, I need to put guards on them. Completely, of course, missing the gasoline that's everywhere around, which could also be used. So cognitive biases, I'm not, I don't have the time to get into it too much, but I think this is a major problem because we're not that rational about risks. And uh, th this is going to be very tricky when we're trying to be uh, uh, doing something effective about risks. Eliezer Yudkovsky has written a pretty nice chapter in uh, our book, of course a small plug here, of uh, about our book about global catastrophic risks, where he points out but especially the really big ones, the really unlikely, and especially uh, the ones that threaten all of humanity, are uh, definitely very easy to get strongly biased about. Mostly, of course, because of the outrage or that the values involved are so big. Uh, for example, the discussion about the Large Hadron Collider, which I will come back to, a lot of the reactions was based on, oh, but it's about the end of humanity. That might have an extra value, but it was also about unknown science. It was about new technology, it seems. It was something you didn't have control over. And that gets uh, people quite out outraged. So, um, on the other hand, if there is something that uh, people take for granted, of course, they tend to underestimate the risks. 
And uh, so first I was thinking of uh, looking at the kind of risks we have every day and we don't tend to notice actually. 